Today on Lockdown Red Wings, a sacrifice has been made to make room for Philip Zadina. Uh, the All-Star Game took place. We'll touch on it a little bit, but we might save that for tomorrow's episode. And also, your questions answered. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, based on your face there during the cold open, looked like you didn't really like that expression all that, that much. That was crazy, dude. <laughs> it was very a very violent expression. <laughs> that, was, that was not. It also wasn't the first take. As it wasn't. You, we never do cold opens in one take. And the first one, that was not the gold <laughs> open in the first thing. So, yeah. The Red Wings murdered Adam Ernie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Make him I was like, <laughs> Uh, welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a free, uh, almost I was a freelance journalist. You're the freelance journalist for the Detroit News, you're and you're a podcast producer for the Detroit Tigers. It's Sunday, man. <laughs> Got a little start of the week, a little cold. Uh, I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J. I did both Thursday and Friday's episodes. Go check them out, please. It helps me keep it helps me stay employed. Um, also, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, official sports book of Lockdown. Every moment more. Visit. FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. Just drop my pen. Man, we are off to a hot start. You're really yeah. crushing oh, it right now. We're the best. We're the best. <laughs> We're professionals. True. So, Scotty, uh, lots of news and notes before we get to the Q&A. And we will answer as many questions as possible. We got a ton, which thank you, first of all. We really appreciate that many uh, of you guys taking it's, the interest. It's so wild. I don't want to, like, like go, you know, for, like, minutes and minutes. But, like, it's, it's crazy how... Um, like I can remember the the really early days of this show when it was like Nolan and I and whatever, and we would be like scared sometimes to put out like mailbag tweets because we were like nobody might respond to this because <laughs> you know it was like the following was like a couple hundred people at the time, like the you know like two years ago now, like the really early days, and um, now it's like that's never even remotely a worry. Like we can rely yeah. on like all the listeners are so not only is has the number grown but like the uh the, like our, our listeners are so interactive and it's so cool it makes it makes the job a million times more fun than it already is everything changed when i joined i don't know wild <laughs> just take all the credit that, that, is, all you that is crazy <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding uh nolan and ethan... the listeners brian goes it wasn't the listeners it was <laughs> <laughs> no, Nolan and Ethan set a fantastic foundation for the podcast, getting yeah. huge, li- like getting huge guests like McCarty and Moritz Sider. And then, of course, you joined and they had, you know, several more huge guests along the way. And this uh, the continued professionalism. I was lucky enough to join right as it was taken off. Um, anyways, let's not go off on tangents. Adam Ernie was waived. And we waited until two o'clock. We were smart today. Luckily, they waved him on a Saturday, so we knew ahead of time that this was happening. So he decided to wait to find out his fate, and he did clear waivers. Uh, one takeaway I'm immediately having is that the Red Wings don't have anybody that any other team wants. <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty quickly here because they every team passed on Verana and Nedeljkovic. For those guys, I would imagine it have to do with you know value. Yeah, the like, team leader contract. in hits now. Uh, probably like Strott or yeah, Cider. I, I would imagine. Trott, I think. I look and it up while you talk. So obviously they sent down Bergen last week. Um, they had to do that to make room for Zadina coming off of the IR. And it was just they could. It was a week off. It made perfect sense. They signed Zadina down to, or they sent him on a conditioning stint rather, not a sign, on a conditioning stint for two games while the All Star break was taking place. But they wanted to bring Bergen back up, and so they had to make room for Bergen. Well, Adam Ernie was the sacrifice, as I put it in the cold <laughs> open, and. Listen, we all love the 100% effort that Adam Ernie puts out, but it was the logical choice. We've been saying Adam Ernie's name and like Robert Haig's name as the guys, or even Gustav Lindstrom as like the three guys that would make most logical sense to send down when it was time to call somebody up. Because Berggren has absolutely deserved his roster spot. Like yeah. he, the, the the value he's putting in is like that way was big more thing. than what Ernie right. was giving. That was the big thing is it was like you – I mean, we talked about it last week. Like you, you – there's zero justification for when Zadina comes back, it being at the expense mm-hmm. of Bergeron. So, like, you you knew, and we have said for months, honestly, that, like, when this team is at full health and we have to make a decision, it's going to be Suter or Ernie, and it was Ernie. Um, yeah. 
so yeah, like love the dog, but uh, kind of kind of had to happen. Uh, can you? There are three players on the Detroit Red Wings with over a hundred hits now. Now that Ernie is gone, there was four. Now there's three. Who are they? Uh, Sherratt, yep. Cider. So Sherratt and Sherratt and Cider are tied for first now with one twelve. Who's the oh. only other one with a hundred hits? This last one's gonna be hard. Hundred hits, so they probably would have had to play the entire season without injury. I'll tell you what, surprise on here. Rasmussen. The four, the, Rasmussen is correct. Let's 105. Go. The next one after Ross is Joe Valeno has 96 hits. The fourth well, most on the team. I'm not surprised by that. See, I, that, that, I like it. I love it. But like that does, I, don't, I wouldn't have guessed it. It wouldn't have been my first guess, but yeah. I love uh, it. Anyways. When Zadina was sent down for his conditioning stint, very briefly made a killer line in Grand Rapids of Vrana, Zadina, and Soderblom. <laughs> and in Zadina's final game, that took place on Saturday. Uh, they played the Texas Stars and absolutely showed out. Vrana had two goals. So he has now eight points in his last seven games with the Grand Rapids Griffins. And uh, Zadina had a goal. And Soderblom had an ass- well, at least one assist. And he scored the shootout winner yeah. to win that game in overtime. So they made Not a lethal line, line. To say and- the least. And then we'll talk. We'll probably have to save this for tomorrow's episode because we did promise this Q&A, this mailbag. But, you know, we've got to talk about Vrana has been heating up lately and he's been getting points like no other in Grand Rapids. You've got to start wondering, like, OK, well, maybe it's a time timeline, yeah. they give him the they give him the call. If not now, at least trade deadline, you would think. But then the final thing, obviously, in news and notes, uh, the All-Star game happened. whoop de doo All-Star game Sorry. sucks. I'm an anti All Star Game guy. I think it's a boring event. But Dylan Larkin had what five goals? So do you like the like games though? The game itself. You're talking about the skill stuff. Skill stuff. Sorry. I like the like normal skill stuff, like hardest shot, speed. But a lot of the other stuff's just gimmicky. I'm like, this is dumb. Yeah, I agree. I I find myself enjoying. We'll talk about it tomorrow. But I find yeah. myself enjoying the skill stuff more in the game at this point. Yeah. But Larkin showed out in the game itself. Was skating actually really hard. Uh, for some reason, but we can get into our <laughs> the, the mailbag stuff. Scotty, I'll let you start, man. What what do we? What's the first question we got that we should answer here? You know, that's a great question. I think. Well, I mean, one of them, honestly, from Jeremy on Twitter was, "What are your thoughts on the NHL All Star Game and activities?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we just answered that. Huh? So I guess we kind of just answered, like like we said, we'll kind of do more in depth on on the All Star Weekend and stuff tomorrow when we have a little bit more time. But uh, yeah, I think that we made that kind of clear. Um, another one we have on Twitter is this one was kind of. Uh, it made me think a little bit. This is from Dave on Twitter. He God says, can you tell us who are the best and worst defensive forwards for the wings this year? Wow. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of a loaded question because coming into the season again, like we we expected that answer to be cop. Like and we did. Like that I would was say few suitor too. Right. Yeah. And, and like that was kind of the expectation and then, like, credit where credit is due, you know, people love to, to to give him a hard time, and he's very controversial. But, like, one healthy Zadina is, like, a pretty darn good defensive forward at this point in his career, and it just hasn't worked out that way. Like, Zadina obviously has barely played. Suter has taken a, a lesser role and hasn't been great defensively. And Cop, while he, he's been better as of late, has certainly not been kind of like the defensive-minded first forward that we kind of expected going into the season. So, I mean, thinking about it, I don't even know if there's anyone that really stands out as like, oh, this is like a really good defensive forward on this team. Um, and I, I mean, the bad ones, that that's kind of a handful. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, unfortunately, like as much as I love Dominic Kubalik and like the style of game that he brings, like he's certainly not very productive and effective defensively. Um, that I mean, that's kind of a... a it's closer to a laundry list than no list. I think if, if I'm going to give you two that are really bad and two that I think have been better, um, I think the two you said one in Dominic Kubalik and I would also say Robbie Fabry are pretty bad defensively. Yeah, They're, that's Fair. not the style of game they play. Everyone should play defense like that's everyone should do do their part. But those two are more offensive zone minded guys for sure uh, when it comes to good defensive uh defensive forwards and i I'm, I'm taking this question as in which forwards play the bet play really good defense not necessarily who is a defensive forward no um, for sure you know i don't know want- if we have anyone that would really you would qualify as yeah. a pure defensive forward well yeah. you would you would think pew Suter 
and Andrew Kopp would be those guys, but they really haven't. I think they've honestly, Q Sears taking a step back this year uh, for, sure. for what he did yeah, last year. We talked year. about that last week. Mm-hmm. And then Andrew Kopp hasn't quite been there all the way yet. He's getting there, but not there. I think Dylan Larkin's pretty damn good uh, defensive agree. four. He shows a lot of heart and hustle. And I would say Michael Rasmussen as well are probably your two forwards that have uh, a defensive upside. He's won throughout game. the year, like, has. Mm-hmm. Like has taken strides in that Absolutely. department. So. Uh, Larkin is like hit and miss. Like sometimes he'll play great, but like it's in there. He's shown in the past, like I can be a great defender. Just he's such a good skater that yeah. like when when the game plan is, and we've talked about this before in the season too. Like when the game plan is like aggressive forecheck, like he can be he can do that really effectively because of how good of a skater he is. But um, that's not the game plan night in and night out. So. Absolutely. Uh, we'll hit our first break, and when we come back, we'll continue answering some questions. But first, got to talk to you guys today about Athletic Greens. Our next product is our next partner is a product you got to use literally every day. Start taking AG1 because with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, and probiotics and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, and focus, aging, all those things. I wonder if it would help my hands not be like scales. It's like I'm a reptile right now with how dry these things are. Um, But AG1 is for your gut health, and it's lifestyle-friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything while still tasting good, and it costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him $100 a day, and he created this all-in-one nutritional insurance that costs you $3 a day, less than $3 a day. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network again. That is athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are doing our mailbag. We'll talk about the all-star game more in depth and it's faci- uh, festivities tomorrow when we give you our game preview. But this next question comes from a friend of mine by the name of Brendan. Uh, he says, I don't have Twitter, but for the, qu- the question thing is nobody has asked yet. How far along do we think the rebuild is? How much longer do you think until we do make the playoffs? And then when will we be actually competitive in the playoffs? So there's like three tiers there. How much longer is the rebuild? When will they make the playoffs and when will they make a run in the playoffs is what it sounded like. Um, Scott, do you want to go first on that answer or should I? Sure. Uh, I think that kind of established last year, uh, we kind of set the bar. I think that next season should be the first year where going into the season, you're thinking – I don't know if expecting is the right word, but I think next season should be the first year that that as a fan base, we're like, hey, the playoffs are like obtainable. That's a realistic goal, and that's something that we should be aiming for. Um, so we'll see how the offseason goes. That'll obviously we, – we will need a very solid offseason, uh, I think, for, for that step to be taken. But uh, I really do think that, that next year is the first year that uh, some pressure should – be put on the Red Wings for expectations to get to the playoffs. Um, as far as as far as everything after that, honestly, I think you can just kind of go year by year. Like I, I don't I don't want to be too like simple about it, but I, I feel like you can just go okay. Like if we make the playoffs next year, then the year after that, you can be like, all right, well, like I expect another step forward. Like I, I think that's pretty natural progression where. If, if you make the playoffs the next year, you can expect a little bit more and then expect a little bit more. So, uh, yeah, like not to be su- too simplistic with it, but I, I think that that's reasonable. I mean, I think you're getting a lot closer. I think that this rebuild is getting – it can be frustrating when you're in this part of the rebuild where you, you're, the progress is starting to be made and it just feels like it's not fast enough. Um, right. And as much as we've been kind of crapping all over the team in recent weeks with how poor their play has been, it's still better than last year. We mentioned that. Uh, yeah. Last week is that technically this is actually better it's still, still on pace for what we said we wanted point like team points wise this season yeah, like about 85. Yeah. So 
the thing is this year, our goal was be on the graphic, you know, stay in the hunt late right. in the year. You don't have to make the playoffs, but stay in the hunt next year. I think that staying in the hunt will be you're fighting for a playoff spot. So when you're talking about how far along the rebuild is or how much longer there is, I, I mean, you know, next year, this is still a really tough division. That's the hard part where yeah. like, Separating the rebuild and how and making the playoffs, I feel like is important because this team could be done with the rebuild and still miss the playoffs because it took, went down to the wire and they just couldn't make it because the Atlantic division is too tough. But I don't want to cop out. Let me give a clear answer. I think in a perfect world, next year is like the final, final year of the build. The year after that is when the expectation to make the playoffs is there. And then the year after that, like you said, you know, you go year by year. If next year is the final year where it's acceptable to maybe not make the playoffs, the year after that is the year you're expected to make the playoffs and you should make the playoffs. And like you said, Scotty, then it makes logical sense that the next year after that, okay, now we're making runs. You know, if that's, I guess, so I would say two years, I guess, next season, and then I guess one more year until the rebuild's over. If next year's a rebuilding year, title technically. And then the year after that is a playoff year. And then the year after that is now we're starting to make runs. I think that answers the question, right? Fair enough. All yeah. right. Back to you, Scotty. Uh, let's see here. We have – this one is from <laughs> Mo Sider loves Jake Wallman on Twitter. I bet you he the does. The question is, is it fair not to give Larkin eight and a half to nine mil if the expectation is that he will eventually back down as 1C on the bottom end of his eight-year deal? Once he signs fans seem to be everywhere with the eight to $9 million rumor. So he's asking if it's fair to give him that much, if he's going to have to be a two C. I think so. If the expectation is that he will eventually back down as one C, I would imagine that that means not be the one C anymore. Okay. This is, this is the ongoing conversation that you and I have had several times is that people are assigning more value to eight, eight to 9 million than the, like, don't get me wrong. That's a lot of money, but that's not superstar money. We've talked about this. Eight to 9 million is not superstar money anymore in this league. Superstar money is 10. And the cap is continuously growing. Yeah. This is, we, we made this analogy earlier, like, uh, and this is not even this dramatic either. Like this yeah. is not even nearly no, this as dramatic as the example I'm going to say, but like, it's, it's, it's like when Stafford got paid. And people freaked out and were like, why is Matt Stafford the highest paid quarterback in NFL history? This is ridiculous. Or in the NFL, like, this is ridiculous. And then, like, within two seasons, he was, like, the sixth highest paid quarterback in the NFL. Brian just left. Um, because <laughs> because the cap kept growing and because <laughs> – Brian's back. Because, uh, because the cap kept growing and that's just, like, the natural progression of how – like athletes and and especially certain position positions get paid like that that value obviously goes up so i i like you brian said we talked about it before i don't think that that like eight to eight and a half million is like a, an overpay for somebody even if he does slot in as a 2c for your team when you're raising a cup like i don't think that's an overpay at all so and even if he is a 2C, like that's a high end 2C. Yeah, like he's, sure. that means if, your team he, is really good. Yeah. <laughs> if you, if Dylan Larkin becomes your 2C, that means you have a, one of the best one, two punches in the league. Right. Because yeah. Larkin is, you know, we go back and forth on what he could be. Like we, we pretty much agree he'll never be, he'll never be like Austin Matthews, but he's still like a, a 1C slash 2C on an all star, on a Stanley Cup winning team, probably 2C. But on a lot of teams, he's still a 1C. So right. eight and a half to nine million. I mean, I would obviously prefer eight to eight and a half, but like then you're just splitting hairs in my eyes. So, and recent reports say now they're down to they've both moved. <laughs> now they're between eight and eight point one and eight point nine, and I'm like, oh boy, know. right here we it's, go. It's so. <laughs> well, we're finding the, they're all going to find that middle ground in eight and a half in the end. Uh, right. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think it's as big a deal as people make it out to be. Like it's it's a lot of money, yeah, it is. But with like you said. Um, when I was totally here, not letting the cat out of the room, <laughs> eight and a half with the cap going up is just not as much as it used Especially to be. Especially over seven years, like eight, mm -hmm. eight and a half this year is not going to be eight and a half in year four, which is yeah. not going to be eight and a half in year seven. You know, like, eight and a half when Lee and Jai Seidel signed his contract was a lot more. And mind you, he signed that contract before he had a 100 point season. 
Right. So like people also making that comparison. We don't have to get down that road again. But Dylan yeah. Larkin, you know, is the going rate for somebody like him is going to be between eight and nine. Even, even Steve Eisman agrees because Steve Eisman's minimum. Or uh, not, I don't know if the, probably his minimum was lower because that's how negotiating goes. But even Dylan, Steve Eisman has offered eight million. So I'm sorry, but that's just the going rate for somebody of Dylan Larkin's um, yeah. production. Like anything over over that is, if people think it's that's too much, then they just don't understand how uh, the current state of the NHL salary is. Um, yeah. let me see if I can get one more in here before we go to break. Let me go. I had one open earlier. Here you go. For mailbag, since the Wings don't have a superstar in their organization right now, this one comes from Shane Barry on YouTube. Has Iserman been holding out to get Austin Matthews? His contract ends next season and the Wings can afford him. Matthews also might not want to sign with Toronto again after not making it past the first round. And he knows how Iserman built Tampa. See, that's a really good question. I like that because obviously next year it's going to be Matthews sweepstakes. Uh, unless an extension is signed. And I don't necessarily agree with people that Matthews is gone because the situation in Toronto is ph phenomenal and he's one of the biggest talents in the league. So like he does, I know we joke about Toronto and like them not making it past the first round. I root for it every year, but they're one of the best teams in the league. And you're looking, if Matthews is actually looking to make a Stanley cup run, he's in a really good situation with them. But so he also is from Arizona as well. So he's an American. So maybe he does want to leave the Canadian market. There's been talks of him not wanting to be there. I don't think don't, I don't think Steve Eisman is waiting for Austin Matthews to hit the market because if Austin Mac Matthews one, it's, it's really bad building strategy, Scotty to build your whole team roster around the hope that a superstar hits free agency. If they do great, but you shouldn't build your roster on the hope that they do. Right. Because that's just in a lot of cases, it doesn't happen. I mean, look at, you know, Nathan McKinnon signed an extension. Steven Stamco signed an extension. Like yeah, guys no, like Tavares. Bank on it, but. Yeah. Guys like Tavares hitting the free agent market just doesn't happen um, that often. So I don't think that Eiserman's waiting for him. But if he did hit the free agent market, I'd bet every single team in the league is throwing the bag at him. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure like tires will be kicked. Like I'm sure that it's not going to be oh, yeah. just like, uh, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm sure that, that all 32 teams will probably pick up the, the phone and give him a call at some point. If he hits the open market, I'm, I tend to lean with you, honestly. Like I, I really think that Toronto is going to do everything in their power to prevent him from hitting the open market or at least continuing to, to be the leader in the clubhouse when he does hit the open market. I, I, I find it hard to believe that they're just going to be like, oh, like, you know, it, it, it didn't work out. Or like, oh, you know, Matthews wants to go play for an American team. Like, I guess that's it. Like, I, I think they're going to do everything in their power to try and keep him. And uh, I guess I really just emulate all your thoughts. Like, I, I don't think that Iserman is necessarily holding out hope, <laughs> constructing the last two years have been building towards like getting Austin Matthews, but like, yeah, I'm sure he'll pick up the phone. Like, ab absolutely. I mean, that's a, uh, that's arguably the best goal scorer in the league. Absolutely. Um, when we come back, we'll continue this conversation, these Q and A's mailbag questions, but first got to talk to you guys today about FanDuel. this year. The only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner, for Lockdown because they're the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download, 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 download FanDuel now so you can bet on Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a fir the first touchdown. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and easy to use. Best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to claim your no-sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty, what is our next question? Um, let's see. What is our next question? Um, from J. Adam Hutchinson on Twitter, we have who will be the one C in two years and why will it be Marco Casper? <laughs> um, I, I really like Marco Casper uh, a lot. I think he's more of a, uh, 
ceiling around uh two C type. And he's gonna be like I think he has the ability to be a really good defensive forward uh and be a solid playmate, like a really good two way forward. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he has uh he has like one C on a cup team ceiling. But I mean he's so young, anything can happen. So I'm really pumped for him. I I can't wait for him to to, to get over here honestly i think he's uh maybe end of next year that might be pushing it but uh, i i think we'll 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 see him relatively ish soon and yeah i can't wait yeah it's definitely it's way too soon to know what his ceiling is a lot of people said that he has like 2c potential when they drafted him but we also know what people said about Moritz Sider when they drafted him. We yeah, know that. yeah, I mean, sure. like we all thought that that was a reach, and people were saying Marco Casper was a bit of a reach. But you see him in his D plus one year over in Europe, and he's having a great year with Rogla. So you never know what could happen. So I guess the answer to that question is, yeah, it could be Marco Casper. But also, no, it might not be Marco Casper. It's just way too early to tell. He's got phenomenal talent. But whether or not that continues to develop into a consistent NHL everyday player is remains to be seen. I mean, it could be Larkin 1C, Casper 2C. I do think that um, he'll be an everyday NHLer, and I do really hope it's in the top six, whether it be 1C or 2C. But again, just it's just so far too early to tell. And a lot of these guys, you got to remember too, a lot of these guys get drafted as centers because they play centers at their levels and then they get to the NHL level and they can't play center. They transition to wing. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened with Robbie Fabry. That's what's happening with Michael Rasmussen, who's still getting time at center. But, you know, guys that are drafted at center don't always play center at the NHL level because it's a wholly different type of workload. So he might end up being like a number one winger because it's it's a easier, give, it gives more freedom to the player. So we'll see. It's too early to tell. I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but I can't, I can't give a definitive answer on him. No, I mean, fair. Um, this next question comes from my buddy, Matt. He goes, if the Griffins continue to stay out of the AHL playoff race, what prospects, if any, do you see called up for a trial at the end of the season? Edmondson, Cross Hannes, McIsaac, uh, Mazur, Soderblom back up. Now, Mazur, we, we, he and I continue our little correspondence after that. Mazur obviously is playing in Denver still this season, but you got to imagine with how he's tearing it up. And ELC is going to come his way. He was kind of basing his question on the assumption that he'd sign an entry-level contract after the college season ended and finishes the year with the Grand Rapids. Um, so, Scotty, Edvinson, Hannes, McIsaac, Missouri, Soderblom, do you see any of those guys getting called up if the Griffins stay out of the playoff race? Uh, I mean, maybe. I, I really think that Soderblom is going to be the one to look at the most there. Yeah, he's playing so good down there, too. Yeah, he's playing super well, Brian. Not good. And I do think that... Proper English. I do think that... Uh, now I'm going to be waiting. Huh? I'm going to be waiting. I'm going to wait for you to screw up. <laughs> I wasn't waiting for you to screw up. You just did oh, in front of me. So I but I will you. be. <laughs> <laughs> he's playing very well down there yes uh and I, I think that that would be kind of one where especially post trade deadline or down the stretch they would not hesitate at all to call up Soderblom and you know like the the Verona we talked about earlier I think that one's kind of its own entity oh, where you know what I mean like it's it's yeah. I don't even know at this point, what's a hundred percent, if it is a hundred percent performance based and like what the timing is about all that. Like, I, I don't really know if anyone can predict or really even speak on the Verona situation at this point. So we'll see what happens with that. But I, I, I do think that Soderblom is probably the most likely to answer the question. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they call Edvinson up for his like nine game trial without kicking in that ELC. Uh, just because maybe very end of the year, maybe. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a very real possibility because remember, trade deadline is going to come, and I have a feeling they're going to they're going to be dealing away some of those guys. I wouldn't be surprised if Olimata gets traded. Um, you know, Robert Haig, anything they'll just throw anyone to anything that can give them picks back because you know those guys aren't part of your future anyways. Uh, so you might have openings on your defensive side as well. And Simon Edmondson has been. He's been transitioning. He's been playing a lot better as the season goes on. He's been playing with more confidence. Seems to be getting used to the ice size. So I wouldn't be surprised if they give him their little nine-game tryout. I will be honest. Uh, you know, I haven't seen a ton of the Grand the Rapids Islanders games. just extended Horvath for eight years. What was the, what was the AAV? Uh, keep talking. I'll find out. 
Uh, Bo Horvat's a hockey player. No, just kidding. Uh, Cross Hannes has got 17 points in 30 games played, so he's got a pretty had a pretty good season. I just don't see I don't see guys like Mazur and Hannes getting called up because I don't think they're NHL ready yet, but they are. I mean, they got great futures. So if, if anyone, I think it'd be Edmondson and Soderblom and maybe McIsaac because he's been marim- marinating for a while down there and he's been pretty consistent. But yeah, I would say probably Edmondson and Soderblom. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um. It sounds like it's 8-8. Eight, eight. Yeah, that's going to hurt Larkin a lot because they have very similar production numbers and their careers started around the same time. If it's 8-8, eight, eight, then you're, Larkin's going to have to I'm only seeing one out. source confirm the 8 mil, but everyone's confirming the 8 years. So I guess maybe we'll yeah. see. But Are you seeing like Irfan Gafar? It, sound, it sounds like 8-8. Eight, eight. That's gonna. I, we'll, that's, see, we'll see, but it it, yeah. Believe there you go. Yeah, believe it's eight eight for Long Island and Horvat. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. I that, think that gives Iserman some ammo because I'm sure Larkin was looking at the Barzal extension and because you got like nine point one. Yeah. But now that Horvat, who also has similar production to those guys, got eight eight. Larkin's gonna be like shit. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, I think we have one more here on Twitter. Mailbag, buyers versus sellers at the deadline. We got asked that question by several people, um, you know, what the the trade deadline will kind of look like and if we're going to be more buyers or sellers. Uh, This person, which is Ace Fishing on Twitter, says most are saying hard sellers since Horvat is gone. There you go. Uh, Predictions on who comes and goes. I feel the I feel only Cider, Raymond, and Larkin are safe. Also, I agree that LCA would burn if they swap Zidina for Berger. And that was a quote in our last episode. Hmm. Um, so I I tend to agree with the fact that, like, really, Cider, Raymond, and Larkin at the NHL level are the only real, like, I, I don't want to say, like, untouchable players, but are, are probably the, the only players that I'm hundred percent confident, like aren't going to get dished. Uh, I, I think, I don't know. Like we'll, we'll talk about it definitely more toward the trade deadline too. But I, I mean, you're really just looking at all your UFAs like immediately is like the easy way to kind of look at that. And then honestly, the, the bigger conversation where that kind of bronze a little bit more is the people that, that ex- are become UFAs after next season. And I think that that's a way that a lot of teams have been utilizing value a lot more in recent years, where instead of just trading away people that ex- their contract expires in four months, you trade people whose contracts expire in a year and four months and you get a little bit more in return. So that'll definitely be something we talk about closer to the deadline. We'll have plenty of trade deadline coverage and stuff. But yeah, it's, it's almost that time. And, and I would agree, I think in a general term, uh, sellers is significantly more likely than buyers. I would say sellers is pretty much a guarantee at this point, because again, we, going into the season, we knew again, like unless con- context is important and this division is really like tough. That's why we were like, they're not going to make the playoffs this year, despite an, a better year. And we even said that they might finish in the same spot in the division, even though that they will have like a 10 or 11 point better year, because this division is so difficult. They could have a sixth place finish last year. They could have a sixth place finish this year and still be 10 points better. Like that's just, this division's ugly. So like sellers yeah. feels like, you know, at the start of the season, barring an incredible run throughout the start, the entire season, they were going to end up being sellers at the deadline because this team just isn't ready to compete yet with this division, which has four heavy hitters in it. Right. The, the only non-seller move that they, I, I could foresee doing and that this market is becoming more and more limited, limited with people like, like Bo going off the board, but the only alternative is you get someone, you you bring in, you buy, quote unquote, somebody that has a lot of either team control or years left on a contract that you know is going to be here long term. I, I don't think they're really in the business of buying short term deals at this deadline. That ship has pretty much sailed. Hey, there's more good news for you. Uh, Max Boltman tweeting out, Phil Pronick off the ice early at practice. I did not see the play, but seemed to hurt his left arm. Great. Yep. I just tweeted yesterday or two days ago that now that Zadina's back, the team's all healthy. Minus Pissick, but, you know, he's not going to be healthy all year, so I'm not counting him. So it's your fault. It's my fault. I jinxed it. Okay, cool. Uh, making sure we're clear. I had one more question I wanted to get to. 
I know we're already over time, but I want to want to give my due diligence to both YouTube and Twitter. And this one comes via YouTube as well. Travis Devoid. Uh, when you say the defense sucks, what exactly do you see as the reasons and what is the solution in your opinions? Well, I think from now on, when we say the defense sucks, we should just end it there. Just no <laughs> contacts. I, I like, I like people not knowing what we mean. Uh, no, I think that when we say the defense sucks, it's because, well, one, they suck. Uh, I suck too. So, you know, I wouldn't be an improvement. That's for sure. A lot of the times when teams, they, they don't do a very good job of denying entry because defense starts before you even get in the defensive zone. If you watch this team on a nightly basis, when they try to break into a zone, it's dump and chase. When other teams try to break into their zone, it's skating right through or right past your defenders. And then as well, when you do get set up or they're breaking down the street, they just streak right past the defenders along the side, burn them on the outside. And then when they get set up in the offensive zone or the defensive zone for the Red Wings, in a lot of cases, there's not a lot of, what's the word I'm looking for? Not confrontation, but resistance in front of our own net. And a lot of chances, and we talk about it with the heat maps after every single game, our opponents, the Red Wings opponents, on almost every single game seem to have four or five of their five on five chances at even strength be in high danger areas down in the slot. And that's because the Red Wings aren't doing a good job of clearing away rebounds and taking away the opportunity from the guy in front. And they lose those net front battles time and time again. And it's not just, it's not just the defense. Of course, the offense has to come out and help as well. You know, the, it's a, this game is quickly becoming a meld of everyone kind of playing the same position at the same time where there's not just a straight defense and a straight forward. If a defenseman goes after a puck, a forward has to make sure they're covering. And a lot of times they're not covering each other and they're missing assignments. That's what we mean when the defense sucks. It's just everything about it isn't working well. They're not, they're missing assignments. They're not covering for each other. They're not taking the guy in front and not taking the passing lane. They're getting burned on the outside. It's, it's a bit of everything. And as far as solutions go, I mean, that's coaching. That's coaching and free agency. You got to get better players. You got to develop better players. And you also have to have a scheme that the team recognizes and works for. I mean, uh, there's no one fix. It's not like you're you're one thing away from having a great defense. It's everything. Yeah, I I, I definitely think you know starting with the end there. I I definitely think that there is no solution for the remainder of this season. Like you just have a bad defense and you're just going to, and that yeah is is just the current state of the team. Whether it is scheme, whether it is formation, whether it is execution, whether it is talent whether it is all of the above, like that's just where you're at right now. You're not going to mid season turn this defense into a, into a powerhouse group. So that that's just how it is. And yeah, the, the, I don't want to say easiest, but the, the biggest reason you can point to for improvement down the road is just going out and getting better players, <laughs> like getting better defensemen. I, I mean, we just did our grades, right. And, and kind of broke down everybody so far at this point in the season, and that that's like the biggest area that you can very easily point to and just be like, well, it would help if we had better players back there on the blue line. And, so like and- that's that's probably the the first and foremost type of thing. And then, yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me is just the lack, as you put it, the lack of resistance pretty much in the slot. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean uh, like we've talked about it a million times that this, this defense doesn't give up 40, 45 shots a night. Yep. They're not giving up crazy shot totals, but – Every shot they give up is high danger, like all of them. And and that's why we give so much of a long leash to the goalie sometimes. It's because like when you watch this team, it's I I, I don't know how any goalie could really be on their head and, and put together consistent good performances when there there's such little resistance. I, I mean, like you said, that you're talking about really easy zone entry, and then even once you're set. Just the ability to go from the blue line and then honestly just like waltz into the point. Like no resistance whatsoever, uh, whether it's uh, it's one pass, whether it's no passes, and just literally just skating into the in, into the point or, or into the slot. Like it's it's just there, there there's no resistance down low whatsoever from anyone. And I I think that it's gonna have to be a, a more overhaul. You know, last offseason we talked about how this defense is going to look way different. There's going to be a lot of new names. And while it did get better, it's still bad. It's just that last year was like historically bad. So well, like, that's th- th- there's going to have to be more overhaul and more, uh, a lot of defensive moves changing again, this off season. It's just, and it's just what's nutty about it too, is 
you know, it is an improved defense from last year. It is like, it's, it is objectively, you said this on Friday's episode, it is objectively a better defensive year than it was last year. And like you said, they're not getting caved in every single night on shots or shot attempts, but it's just the quality of those shot attempts seems to be crazy high. It's yeah. whenever a goal happens, it's because it's a missed assignment or somebody messed up, which happens, but it seems to happen to the Red Wings at a higher frequency. Cause like, you can go at statistics and when you go to Corsi four expected goals against uh, high danger shots against, they are like middle to middle bottom of the league. It's not, they're not great. They're not good, but they're not like the worst in the league at it either. But it just seems like when you're watching the game on the eye test and you look up the heat map after every single game, you just have that high concentration right out in front of the net where the other team's getting a ton of shots off. So yeah. Yeah. That's what we mean when we say the defense sucks and we should probably use better words than sucks. I don't know if we have actually said that or if that's just how we imply it, but defense is not very good. Most nights. Um, we should They've use better been adjectives. Struggling this season. Yeah, you're a better. You're the writer, so you should be using better adjectives. I I have an excuse. I don't write. Uh, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> we'll be back on Tuesday. We'll talk about the All Star Game. We'll talk about the implications of Zadina getting called up, and we'll talk about a game preview because hockey is back on Tuesday. Ooh. If you're a Red Wings fan, which is exciting. I actually kind of like. I've been missing it, man. I've been missing it. We'll see how I feel after Tuesday's game, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Any final thoughts, Scotty? We ball. We ball. Thanks for all the questions, guys. Sorry, couldn't get them to them all. Uh, But we'll be back. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day.